Yes, he's mad. I do so love custard. Or was it mustard? We removed your brain. Do you comprehend, commie animal? Get your act together. You're making us look like a collection of round earthers. Vivisect me, please. You think I don't know? I'm crazy, I sound. Of course I do. They made me just to torture me. The things you do with our body are suicidally dangerous. You're a monster. A deranged monster. Big Mountain is just a peculiar place, but the Wild Wasteland trait makes it even more peculiar than any other place in Fala, New Vegas. At the very beginning of the game, when making our character, we have the opportunity to choose two traits. One of these traits is called Wild Wasteland. With this trait active, we have a chance to stumble upon crazy and zany scenes that may or may not make much sense in the world. Now, the makers of Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 have a long history of putting silly things and pop cultural references in the game. According to Joshua Sawyer, one of the designers for Fallout New Vegas, the Obsidian team argued over whether or not to include these somewhat jolting pop culture references in the game. Some wanted to maintain the spirits of Fallout 1 and 2 and include them. Others thought that it was a bit jarring and it popped people out of the realism of the world. A compromise was made with the inclusion of the Wild Wasteland trait. For players who didn't mind such zany occurrences, they could take the Wild Wasteland trait and stumble upon them as they explore the Mojave. Obsidian included some Wild Wasteland occurrences in every single DLC. However, they included more in Old World Blues than any of the others. There are three in Dead Money, only two in Honest Hearts, and a whopping ten in Old World Blues. Let's use this opportunity to hunt down and examine each of them, and at the same time we'll explore in depth the locations where we find them. Now, if you've been following this series, you'll recall that I've already talked about a few of them. I'll briefly summarize the ones we've covered already. When doing the quest High School Horror inside the X-8 facility, we see the word Wolverines spelled on the wall of the high school. This is a reference to the 1984 film Red Dawn. The world in that movie, like the Fallout universe, takes place in an alternative timeline. In that movie, a bunch of high school students engaged in guerrilla warfare to resist Soviet occupation. The high school students called themselves the Wolverines. We find another one inside the high school while exploring the observation pods above. When we peer out of one of the windows, we see five cyber dogs sitting at a table smoking cigars and playing poker. On a wall right above them are the words, sit, stay, kill. In this instance, Obsidian is poking fun at popular home decor. The dogs are a reference to a famous series of paintings of dogs playing poker and smoking pipes and cigars that stretch all the way back to 1894, when the first painting was made by Cassius Marcellus Coolridge. He was commissioned to craft this painting by the Brown and Bigelow Cigar Company to advertise their line of cigars. We can now find this painting and paintings like it as prints to hang on our walls in department stores. Sit, stay, kill on the wall is a reference to the popular home decor phrase, live, laugh, love, which people will also hang on their walls. The next one that we've already covered is when we visit Higgs Village. When exploring behind Dr. Boris's house in search for his dog named Gabe, a teeny tiny deathclaw appears in Gabe's doghouse named Stripe. This is a reference to the movie Gremlins. The leader of the Gremlins was a gremlin named Stripe. Stripe in Higgs Village is an incredibly difficult deathclaw who can pretty much one-shot you. He one-shotted me a number of times. I had to do this encounter four or five times before I finally killed him. Now in the movie Gremlins, Stripe the gremlin is finally killed after being exposed to sunlight, whereupon his body slides into a fountain. In the game, Stripe the Deathclaw is afraid of fountains for this reason, and when we back towards the fountain, he will turn around and walk away. After learning this behavior, we can use it to our advantage to kite him around Higgs Village and chip away at his health. When he's dead, we can explore the doghouse where we find a, quote, chicken, unquote, leg, which is again a reference to gremlins because Stripe's favorite food in gremlins was chicken. 
The next one takes us to the X-12 facility, right next door to the Think Tank. It's the first building just west of the Think Tank. We read a lot about this building when exploring X-8. This is the place where some of the scientists lost a K-9000 while trying to destroy one of the Y-17 walking harnesses. Upon entry, we see that the stairway down is blocked off by a force field. Thankfully, by now, we've found the force field buster sonic frequency for our sonic emitter so we can destroy Destroy it. However, as soon as we do, the enemy is deeper in this facility, spot us and attack. We get attacked by a bunch of walking harnesses, and shortly after killing the one at the bottom, a bunch of Y-17 trauma override harnesses appear at the door. Now, I was crouched and hidden so they didn't notice me, and I think that they're scripted to run to the very bottom of this pit as soon as the Y-17 trauma override harness at the bottom is killed. Since I killed him from this top floor, they ran to the bottom while attacking me. Only once they reached the bottom and completed their script did they turn around and come back up. But the interesting thing is while the Y-17 trauma override harnesses are attacking, we hear... Hey, who turned out the lights? One of these guys said, hey... Who turned out the lights? Now, we didn't see the Wild Wasteland sound effect play because these guys have a chance to say this anytime we stumble upon them, which means we can trigger this Wild Wasteland event many times in our gameplay, and I had already triggered it previously. But that phrase, hey, who turned out the lights, is a reference to the 2008 episode of Doctor Who called Silence in the Library. Hey, who turned out the lights? In this episode, a mysterious force kills people by invading their spacesuits and then reanimating their corpse. In one such scene, the substance will then echo phrases that the dead person at one time had said in an attempt to give people nearby a false sense of security. Hey, who turned out the lights? Hey, who turned out the lights? Doctor, don't. Dave, can you hear me? Hey, who turned out the lights? But of course this backfires on them because they don't understand how humans talk, causing the suit they have possessed to repeat the same phrases over and over again like a recording. I think this shows us that Obsidian got the idea for their Y-17 trauma override harness from this episode of Doctor Who. After clearing all of the Y-17 trauma override harnesses, we can examine a terminal right here on this top floor near the door. This is the X-12 terminal. Inside we find the same three entries that we read in X-8. The entries were the X-12 scientists requested help from X-8 to deal with the trauma override harness that had rebelled against them. X-8 responded by sending them a K-9000 Cyberdog gun, but the researchers here at X-12 promptly dropped it, and it was picked up by one of the Y-17 harnesses. So, hopefully 200 years later, we can find the gun here. Continuing forward, these trauma override harnesses wield extremely high-level energy weapons. On one of the corpses, we find a Gauss rifle. The only other one we've found so far was used by Father Elijah at the very end of Dead Money. This is a welcome find, for now I can at last repair my Gauss rifle. Continuing across the catwalk on another harness, we find, as we were told we would, a K9000 Cyberdog gun. This is one of only two two cyberdog guns in the entire game. The first we get from the think tank scientists after passing a gun check at the very beginning of the DLC. That's where I got my first one, but this is the only other one. Since crafting the Fido variant of the Cyberdog Gun requires one Cyberdog Gun in our inventory, we need to get both of these guns so that we can have one Fido and so that we can upgrade the other with all of the Cyberdog Gun upgrades we'll find later. The Cyberdog Gun mods don't work on Fido. Continuing down the steps, we arrive at the second catwalk level. There's a door in the northwestern corner, but we're going to go ahead and explore this in a minute. Continuing around this catwalk, we can loot even more containers until we reach a stairway that brings us down to the ground floor. Here we find a chemistry set on a work table that we can use to make some stim packs, and then on the other table we find a stack of 357 Magnum rounds, which come in handy for the Cyberdog gun. In the middle of the room we find a projector on a table, and leaning against it is the holotape Light Switch 1 Upgrade 
Smart Lights. This is the upgrade to the AI Personality Light Switch 1. We'll go over everything it does in an upcoming video. Going back up the stairs to level 2, we can go through that door, we find some boxes of ammunition on a shelf, and a big stash of 5mm rounds. And then following the hallway, we see that it leads to a dead end. Here we just find a whole bunch of ammunition boxes. A great way to stock up. As we head out, we find another door we missed previously against the southwestern wall. Inside, we find yet another storage room with even more ammunition. The next Wild Wasteland encounter takes place at the Magneto Hydraulics Complex. We find the door to this complex inside the big red scar that Dr. Klein told us about. This is a giant canyon lined with glowing red crystals that ultimately leads to the Forbidden Dome. Heading inside this complex, complex, we hear Wild Wasteland trigger as we leave a tunnel. On the ground right next to us is a giant walking eye, uh, but we can't interact with it. It doesn't move or do anything, and it's not the only one. We find three others. There is one on top of a floating pod in the middle of this room, and then inside the pod, we find one hanging from the ceiling and another one sitting on a desk. What are these walking eyes? This is a reference to Venture Brothers. In this series, Dr. Venture creates a bunch of walking robotic eyes but for what purpose, not even he seems to know. Cool beans! What is it? It's a walking eye, Hank. And the government loves it. What does it do? <clears throat> I don't know, walking eye stuff. Whatever, this isn't rocket science. All right, it could be considered a branch of rocket science. Camera in the eye? Completely. So it shoots lasers and stuff? Daddy's little man. Well, probably like a bucket comes down for like water or even like monkeys. That could totally drive it. Thank you, Hank. Here you go. I guess it would be good for stealth reconnaissance. Yeah, well, of course it would be good for reconnaissance applications. Well, what does it do? Walking eye! That, uh, uh well, uh, that has a camera, iris-mounted lasers, monkey-proof welding, and silent stealth design that makes it perfect for reconnaissance applications. You got that from us. Walking eye, Hank. They are all the same. I have it written down from yesterday. This chamber is pretty flooded, so we need to make good use of a rebreather to explore it. The most important thing is inside the pod. Here on a desk next to one of the walking eyes is a holotape sync project, Sync. This is the artificial intelligence needed to awaken the sink inside the sink. In a footlocker on the ground, we find a full suit of recon armor, including the helmet, and then putting on our rebreather, we can dive into the water. Here we just find a bunch of containers to loot. There's a sunken chamber to the south, but it's not very big, and inside we also only find a few containers to loot. But as we leave, we stumble into yet another wild wasteland encounter. Attention, Lavatomites! Do not neglect to wash the walking eye. That, of course, was the voice of Dr. O, but the voice actor who voices Dr. O is none other than James Urbaniak, who voices Dr. Venture in Venture Brothers. This line is a reference to the 2006 episode of Venture Brothers called Fallen Arches. In this episode, Dr. Venture is jealous of the attention that one of his rivals, Dr. Orpheus, is getting, and so to attract attention to himself, he takes one of his walking eyes outside and begins to wash it in a seductive way, reminiscent of Lucille washing her car in the film Cool Hand Luke. Thanks for helping me with the walking eye. Oh, look at this walking eye. It's filthy. Ugh. Guess I should wash off my walking eye. This walking eye washing session excites all of the nearby supervillains causing havoc. This one, like the Who Turned Out the Lights Wild Wasteland encounter, can happen many times and in random locations. I was just lucky that it happened to me right after discovering the walking eyes, but it happened to me elsewhere as well. Do not neglect to wash the walking eye. The next Wild Wasteland encounter is perplexing. When walking southwest of Little Yangtze towards the train tunnel, we hear the wild wasteland effect while passing what appears to be a destroyed truck. Going back to the truck to see if we can figure this out, we see a big green puddle of goo and the truck appears to be partially embedded in the rock. Its tires are sunken in the dirt and the truck part is completely missing, buried somewhere in the rock. The license plate reads Rocket 88. 
I had absolutely no idea what this was. But after doing a bit of reading, one of the best theories that players have is that this is a reference to the 1984 film The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. It appears to be referencing a scene in the movie where the team is testing some sort of scientific supersonic vehicle. This vehicle has rockets strapped to the back, and through a series of unexplained sci-fi miracles, the vehicle passes into a myriad of different dimensions after driving right into the side of a rock. Now, unlike what we find in Fallout New Vegas, we don't see half of the vehicle sticking out. In the movie, the vehicle successfully phased into another dimension by driving into a mountainside. We find the next Wild Wasteland encounter while exploring the construction site. We stumble upon the construction site walking northwest of Little Yang Z. Here we drop down into a valley wherein we find a bunch of elevated tanks, pallets, barrels, concrete slabs, containers, fuel tanks, derelict trucks, and of course, sentry bots. After destroying the sentry bots, we get attacked by Mr. Handys. And after destroying the Mr. Handys, we get attacked by Protectrons. There's a large crane in the middle of the construction site, and climbing up on top of it, we find at the very top a Valance Radi Accentuator, which we covered in Episode 4, and a crate with some ammunition and junk inside. After exploring this top portion, we can head to the western section of the construction site, which dips down a little bit into some sort of gem field. We see big red gems sticking out of the rocks, and as we get closer, The wild wasteland sound effect triggers because we see a bunch of gnomes or dwarves. They all hold pickaxes, and there are seven of them. This, of course, is a reference to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. We find a few containers down here, as well as one grave carrying randomized loot. I found a shotgun inside the grave. Heading to the northwestern section of this site on the ground, next to a skeleton, a backhoe, and some buff out, is the holotape sink upgrade Water production. This is one of the upgrades we can install into the Sync AI after we activate it. This incidentally is also where I found that downed perimeter fence pylon that I tried to bypass to escape the crater in episode 2. The next Wild Wasteland encounter appears when talking with Dr. Mobius towards the end of the DLC. Now, I'm not going to give away any spoilers. We'll cover Dr. Mobius in full towards the end, but during our conversation, there is one moment when talking about his previous attempts to thwart the think tank where he says... I suspect I have Plan 9s in place, but I may have coded myself to forget them, just in case. They're probably very dangerous, lethal, or worse. So I had to do something else to keep them occupied here, or as you like to say, trapped. I prefer to have several Plan 9s in case the 7s fail. Now, without the Wild Wasteland trait, instead of saying Plan 9s, he says Plan Cs. He has already talked with us about Plans A and B. But in saying Plan 9, he is likely making a reference to the infamous Ed Wood horror sci-fi movie called Plan 9 from Outer Space, a movie that at one time had been described as the worst movie ever made. Interestingly, Ed Wood's working title for this movie was originally Grave Robbers from Outer Space. Perhaps then Plan 9 has something to do with the grave robbing we found evidence of inside the X-Aid facility. The pre-war scientists had already done a bunch of grave robbing so that they could experiment on bodies, presumably to experiment on the Y-17 walking harnesses. And the last Wild Wasteland encounter appears right on the side of the Rock Dome. On the far eastern side, we find some graffiti. Kilroy was here. This is a reference to... Well, what I guess we could call a meme that appeared during World War II. Military servicemen during World War II would draw this little graffiti wherever they went, on barracks, on airplanes, on vehicles, in bunkers. It was a bit of an inside joke between military servicemen of World War II. This graffiti has been memorialized on gravestones and plaques. We even find it tucked in a corner at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. And here's some footage shot in 1946 of a Navy serviceman scrawling the Kilroy Was Here graffiti on the side of his boat. 
Who was Kilroy? Well, nobody really knows. However, one explanation is that the phrase comes from a real-life person named James J. Kilroy. During the beginning of World War II, James Kilroy worked as an American shipyard inspector. At the time, shipbuilders were paid by the number of rivets that they put in. A riveter would place a chalk mark after the last rivet he put in at the end of his shift to show his boss how many rivets he did during his workday and to create a starting point for the next worker. However, dishonest workers would sometimes erase the chalk mark and push it back several rivets to make it seem like they actually put in more. Kilroy, the inspector, would put an end to this by placing his own signature, Kilroy was here, after the rivets that he had already inspected. This would dissuade the next worker from pushing that chalk mark back. These marks were placed in areas that would become covered up as the ship was being built. Many years later, as ships would be opened up for repair work, sailors would discover this strange mark. Kilroy was here, and they found it on a variety of ships that all happened to be processed through the same shipyard. Kilroy then almost became a mythical creature. Well, if his name could appear in a place that no graffiti artist could ever reach, well then where can't he go? He could go to the enemy bunkers, he could appear on enemy ships, and enterprising American soldiers took on the mantle of Kilroy and would put his name all over the world. He became sort of like a mascot, a protective talisman of the American GI. It was just a silly inside joke that service members shared. Similar to Leroy Jenkins or Perfect Spot for a Mirelurk Den. And those are the 10 Wild Wasteland encounters that I have been able to discover in Old World Blues. What are your thoughts on the Wild Wasteland trait? Do you think that it adds something fun to the game, or do you find it distracting? Let me know in the comments below. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop, folks. Awe, true to Kaisar. That's right, Legion fans, I've got a shirt just for you. On the front, we have the Legion bowl with the words Awe, true to Kaisar, and on the back, an infamous Legion mask with the words Retribution. You can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. This ends episode six of Old World Blues, but ladies and gentlemen, there is so much left to do. We need to find and install all of the remaining sync personalities as well as their upgrades. We need to pick up the trail of Father Elijah and Christine and discover who this courier was. We've got to find the third piece of technology, the stealth suit, and confront Dr. Mobius and retrieve our brain. I publish a new episode six days a week, and if you don't want to miss episode seven, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you on Monday. So enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I'll see you bright and early Tuesday morning with Episode 7.